Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the to the PwC Family Business Lunch Hour event today. Today is the fifth event of our six uh, part series, and today we are going to focus on resilience and agility. I'm really looking forward to today's event. We've got um, two people on our panel that has vast experience in dealing with agility and also resilience, but we'll hear more about that a bit later on, and I'll also introduce them shortly. Um, my name is Scott Barnard. I'm the PwC Africa Family Business Leader, and I'm joined today by Andrea Benkenstein, who's from our center, Family Business Center of Excellence. I'm very excited to hear from our panel today. We are joined by Dr. Elakim Demarklo, who is the Managing Director of the Nairo Medical Center in Accra. Um, Elakim just shared with us that his, his son uh, bumped his head. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, part of what we're going to talk today uh, about today is all about resilience and, uh, you know, how we deal with challenges um, as, you know, as, as and when they happen. So, uh, Elakim, I'm sure you will share with us uh, a lot of you know, real life experiences today. And uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your very busy, busy schedule um, to be with us today and to share with our participants. We are also joined by Peter English, who is the PwC Global Family Business Leader. Um, and in that global role, I mean, you can imagine that Peter comes across many family businesses globally and uh, some of the challenges that they face. Peter, thank you very much for taking time out of your holiday today. I know you are in New Yorker. Peter is normally based in Germany and uh, in Europe, the skies have been open. So Peter has been able to travel um, to New York. But thank you very much for your time today, Peter. Pleasure and thank you for having me. So I'm going to hand over to Andrea immediately. I don't want to take out any of the, the time that we have left. I'm sure we're going to run out of time today. Um, so for all the participants, um, you will see on the bottom right hand side of your screen, there's a, a drop down box where you can type in questions. Please ask questions as we go through the interviews and you'll also see polling questions drop down, which Andrea will announce as and when they arrive. Um, please answer those as well, because it will also inform some of the questions that you ask as we go through the discussion. So thank you, Andrea, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Gok, and um, thanks to our wonderful panelists. So family businesses are inherently resilient, whether recently founded or long established. Newer family businesses have survived and thrived in the toughest of environments. Older ones have ridden out world-changing events from wars to recessions to natural disasters. Resilience is part of a family business's DNA, underpinned by deeply held values and purpose, long-term horizon, agile decision-making, patient capital, and rock-solid commitment to their workforce and community. However, the COVID-19 pandemic is severely testing all the attributes that give family businesses a competitive edge and the ability to survive and prepare to rebuild is critical um, to the future of their family, their business and all the people who rely on it. As in any crisis, family owners must and have to stand united, find their commitment to their business and speak with one voice. Sending a strong message to employees, business partners and the public is and was vital. It's important as to how businesses leverage on the lessons learned during the pandemic, um, as it will further boost the competitive edge that they have in the market. So, but before we go into more detail, um, I just want to again say thank you for the panelists. And we start with you, Elegum. So you have had a very challenging few months, both from a business perspective and also from personal health. So it's great to have you here today. Um, can you share a bit more about your experience? Thank you so much, um, Andrea, for having me and um, to everyone here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, the COVID-19 um, impact in Ghana, which is where we're based, um, started in March when we picked up as a hospital and um, the business, the family business is in healthcare. And so we picked up um, the first few cases um, in the country, mostly because there were travelers and travelers were coming into the private sector as compared to the public sector. But then we started to see, I mean, we had been seeing what was happening around the world and that had already affected us as a company. And so our business continuity plan was very much a topic of discussion at our board. 
and the shareholders in terms of the impact. And very quickly, we had decided that we were going to lean in to the, um, to the pandemic. Um, in the past, you know, being in Ghana in, in a tropical country, you have infectious diseases like Ebola. And in the past, I mean, uh, we were very much in the community, very much um, were involved in that public health response. So this was not necessarily different, but the impact was probably going to be significant. So um, we have a diagnostics arm as well, and that really, we started to try and look at who was supplying, you know, PCR equipment for testing. Um, all the normal, you know, players like Roche were really not um, available. Um, and, but it was through partnership and relationship. And I think that's where, you know, our commitment to the community, we built lots of partnerships over that time. And we were able to leverage a partnership um, which had a global supply chain, especially links to China, and that enabled us to get PCR equipment, whereas other people couldn't. Um, and so we were able to be the first organization to be testing in the private sector to be testing for COVID-19 and also obviously on the treatment side. Um, I, I do want to say that when it comes to resilience, that's a key topic for me because the organization was very, very political, very challenging. Um, our revenue dropped significantly because our outpatient services, which is where the bulk of our revenue comes from, um, mainly because of the lockdown, um, was severely impacted because patients could not come into hospital. So we had to be very agile and quick to make some changes. We were planning virtual care um, for the ending of the year, so we had to accelerate that. And um, yeah, maybe that was kind of on the business front, lots of lessons learned about how to quickly adapt, quickly move, um, and the power of teamwork in that was key. Personally, for me, um, you know, despite being a doctor and um, taking all the necessary precautions, um, you know, we picked up, it. Um, COVID had spread into the community wow. and our home, we were exposed through a contact. Um, and so we, my whole family had COVID-19 um, in terms of the disease. Myself and my wife had the symptoms um, of, you know, fever, headache, muscle ache, um, and our children were completely fine. I mean, they were asymptomatic, so it really fits the mold. But um, the impact was that the day I was diagnosed from our lab, which was within 24 hours, the next day we had to suspend our operations for testing because of a public-private partnership conversation. Um, there was there were no guidelines and. Um, you know, we were testing and picking up many cases. So whilst I was um, sick, um, we had to just work with our public health services and we were able to come up with guidelines and really influence that guidelines for public private um, partnership in this um, state. So I think maybe what I'll do is end here to say that um, the experience was really one of um, leveraging relationship, seeking support, Definitely, we didn't do it our, ourselves, and um, everyone chipped in from the shareholders. Um, and the shareholders are the family members. So my mom, my two sisters, um, everyone remotely joining into calls. Um, very challenging time, but we made we made some good decisions. Sure, that's intense, but amazing. Thanks for sharing. So, what would you say as the experience taught you? Oh, um, so far. <laughs> <laughs> Many lessons. I mean, I think obviously um, I'd learned a few lessons in the past. I think the first one was um, to put in the structures or the plans before the crisis happens. So basically to anticipate the crisis. And, and when you have the plans, it becomes um, a bit, you kind of work from that urgency. And so some things had already been planned. Um, so our business continuity had already been in place. Um, and that stemmed from the family governance workshops we had done with PwC. I, I mean, that was from 2017. Corporate governance, I mean, all of these governance structures were really important um, to put in place. And I think they really came out, they came alive um, during this season, mainly because um, the structures were working. Um, I would say that it was there, were, there was definitely conflict. I mean, a lot of people were stressed. My family members, we had lots of conflict between myself and my sister. But the good thing was that because we had these structures and we had a, a framework for um, going through it, um, it didn't really impact the decision making. So decision making was 
definitely tough, um, not easy conversations, but we were able to come to a decision. So maybe that's the biggest lesson to really anticipate what would be the conflict scenarios, what would be the problems um, and put something in. But then maybe I'll say the second thing for me personally was also to manage myself. It was uh, like everyone here, I'm sure everyone has gone through very stressful and very an anxious moments. And so I had to really pay attention to my mental health well-being in terms of, um, you know, eating well, exercising, continuing to keep up with moving, especially when you're remote working. Um, you know, I did a lot of work with seeking support. So coaches and, you know, even to a point getting a clinical psychologist to, you know, help when, you know, things were really all the conflict, all the change was happening so much. So I think that's probably a testament and I want to share that, that, you know, that personal support network, um, really amping that in this time was really key to my ability to continue on. Sure, thanks. Thanks for sharing. Um, and just Peter, to, to check in with you as well, um, what has your experience been and uh, what have you seen in the, the global family business uh, community? Yeah, obviously there was uh, a lot of uncertainty so because nobody was um, exposed to a similar situation in the past. So it was uh, really a unique challenge to master. And as Elikim said, so there has been the different levels of personal well-being, taking care of yourself and your family. Luckily, in my family, we didn't have an infection, but uh, uh, some of the friends got an infection and uh, my brothers are medical doctors, therefore we know how severe and how serious the situation can become. So therefore, personal well-being and protecting the family has been a big issue of everybody here in Europe, in Germany, even if Germany was, compared to other countries, doing quite well with the severe cases and the death cases and so on. From a business perspective, uh, we as entrepreneurs, we as a partnership uh, at PwC, we had to navigate through the uncertainties like our clients in Germany, but also in other countries. And the entrepreneurs that I had the, the chance to, and the pleasure to speak with during that challenging times of uncertainties, they were all very happy that they have a solid fundament that they could build on strong unity amongst the shareholders, which is one of the important aspects. So Alekim started to elaborate on that, avoiding conflicts. So, but this was not always the case. We see, especially in places like Middle East, so that more family tension, more family conflict has, um, has arised during that time. Uh, but overall, it went quite well if you are quite good prepared. But companies and many of the companies uh, in the automotive mobility sector, for example, so the entire business model stopped in a way. Yeah. So uh, also in other sectors, in some industries, there was nothing to do anymore. And uh, some families were really very clever and smart to adjust very quickly and to repurposing their business very quickly. I think uh, there are a couple of examples that I can give to you. There are, so has been some automotive uh, supplier companies in the US and in Germany who um, switched their production from automotive parts into ventilation system to help to treat patients. Others in the, in the textile business moved from doing t-shirts and stuff into into uh, uh, face masks very quickly. Within days, they changed production. And even large players like L'Oreal, LVMH Group, say they were able to turn around the production from perfumes to hand disinfection. And I think these are good examples how important it was that a dominant owner at the core was able to give the entire business a new direction for the time where it was needed. And this kind of flexibility was one of the cornerstones that the, the owners and the businesses was not just able to secure the jobs for the employees, but also were able to, uh, to demonstrate how, 
how relevant entrepreneurship and family business really are, and they were able to renew their license to operate in the in this distressed times of fear and uncertainty. So these were just a few observations I can talk for hours, Andrea, as you can imagine, <laughs> but let me pause here for a second. But I think this was, uh, was uh, something that I was most proud of our clients and most, most impressed by how quickly they find new ways of solving new problems that have been unknown before. So their agility, their ability to repurpose their business, to do things different very quickly was very impressive. Sure. Yes, and I would think that's definitely a competitive edge of family businesses um, with regards to agility. So if we come back to uh, just effective governance, so those for family and a corporate, um, we know it's critical at any time, but even more um, vital during a crisis when the trust, transparency and clear expectations um, it can create, be a real differentiator and helping you manage current and future challenges in the right way. Um, that said, a crisis such as today has created governance risks that go beyond the usual challenges. So, you should keep the director's duties front of mind to avoid any inappropriate action being taken. So, we have uh, our most recent um, African CFO, so CFOs were surveyed and 80% believe that the current situation makes their companies better in the long run, um, which, is, which is fantastic. So, Elegem, if we come back to, to the medical center, um, were there governance procedures and processes that you had to change? Um, and do you think it will have long-term effects or is it only for now? No, for sure. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, um, the emergency, the, the crisis has um, definitely strengthened the way we work. Um, I'll give a clear example how we do meetings. Um, so, you know, it was, we had Microsoft Teams for the last two years, um, we're using Office 365. However, Utilization was less than 10%. People were probably using it, the emails and the, um, some people using the um, Office 365 work documents like Word, etc. But not a lot of collaboration and um, only a few people doing that. What happened with the pandemic was very quickly, extremely quickly, we moved um, to teams. I mean, utilization across board, clinical teams as well as operational teams and um, meetings were all virtual um, as far as possible. We have a few sites um, and what that enabled us to do actually, what we saw was that we were able to be more inclusive um, because in the past where meetings were, meet, were physical, people had to travel and come. But actually because it was virtual for decision-making, it was actually easier because everyone could connect. So, um, you know, across board from the board, shareholders um, and even the, and then obviously the internal um, operations. Um, I think that the benefit of this has been to teach us that we can actually do a lot more um, remotely, um, especially with having meetings. Our board meetings, we had emergency board, we had about, um, it, as soon as it came into the country, we had um, two emergency meet board meetings within, two, um, within the month. And um, we have a quarterly board rhythm. so. Having two board meetings within um, a month, and one of our directors is in Australia, uh, in Tasmania. So the time difference, and the other is in other was in Lebanon. Um, and you know, we found that actually, um, just the timing. Once we had settled on the time, everyone could connect, and we had everyone present. So I think it's definitely going to make us more resilient for the future. Um, and the experience has been, you know, evolving. So. Um, Definitely, we will be doing a hybrid when things settle, because the physical nature is obviously has a powerful impact. But there's so many things that we can do remotely, and I think we're doing that now. Wonderful. I think we've seen exactly the same thing um, when we think PwC and our clients. Everybody's more um, moving towards the remote working and um, the amount of time you save for not traveling to, to certain areas. Uh, so we've been receiving questions from the floor. So I just want to um, quickly check on them. Um, so the first question was for you, Elikim. How important was it to communicate with non-family employees and get their input, or was it um, any responsibility with the dominant shareholders that Peter referred to? Yeah, no, it's a great question because, um, and I always go back to um, 2017 when we had our family governance workshops. 
Um, the family governance side of it was really around the family shareholders um, and the clarity between them as to how, how involved do they want to be, um, but also for the business to grow, what was required for the business. And I think that's where the clarity around the corporate governance um, versus the family governance was really um, all the conversations started from there. So one of the things that we did was to, um, my, my mother was the then chairman of the board. Um, I was the CEO and what one of the decisions out of that was having an independent chairman um, and having, we had a majority independence on the board. Um, so when it came to then my executive team and then the managers, the organization was to run as a business. So really engaging from the front line, capturing information and feeding that all the way up and then back down. I mean, we have been strengthening that process since then. So, you know, weekly meetings, monthly meetings, um, cascading into the quarterly board meetings. So engaging all staff um, in, in that way was really easy um, because it was really about the business and how we've been improving over three years. In contrast to, you know, how we were working before where the shareholders were very much involved, um, you know, what the shareholders now had the time to do was to focus on the family assets and we hadn't um, whilst we were focusing on this the business at the same time we were having shareholder meetings um, which was really around um, all the other assets how do we manage that um, what would be the impact especially if we're not going to be getting dividends especially if we're not going to be having um, you know different benefits um, you know what what do we do to that continue that diversification and um, at the same time, we were raising capital for the company. So actually, just um, yesterday, we had a press briefing um, with IFC. And, um, we had um, a $5.2 million loan, which was approved, I mean, which was announced yesterday. Um, but then going through that had implications for shareholders um, versus the company. So I think that um, maybe I would say that by freeing up the shareholders to focus on the big picture, still having control and still being involved, but it meant that we could do a lot of things at the same time. Um, so I hope um, in terms of the importance of the non-family members, the non-family uh, members, which is really around the, the whole organization, we're able to focus on, on that, on the operations. I must say that's also amazing what you've seen, like everybody come together and work together um, in a crisis time, it's, it's amazing. Maybe Andrea, I can add to what Elikim just uh, just just outlined. I think there are a couple of very important aspects. I think um, every family business today has to prove to the public, to the customer, to the shareholders what they stand for. So, what is their license to operate? Yeah. So, and I would like to stress this license to operate. Yeah. So, because since the 19th, 1990s, early 20s, uh, 2000, so uh, business uh, moved away from the concept of shareholder value, maximizing profit for those who are owning the business. Doesn't matter what it takes to opt um, uh, to to make the shareholder richer. So I think this concept has been overcome by the idea that every business has to make a contribution to employees, to the public, to environment, to make the, uh, the the our planet a better place. Whatever it is, this was also the origin of the UN Sustainability Goals, the SDGs. And going forward, this will be of critical and, and even more importance going forward. And the crisis now was an opportunity. I see this crisis as an opportunity, even if it hurts. And when it comes to the element of governments and aligning the interest of employees, shareholders, and the general public and business partners, this was a very, very good example how to do it right by continuing to believe and to live up to the family values, to the core beliefs of the owners, or doing the opposite. We have seen a couple of companies preaching that they are loyal and treating their workforce well. And they were the first one laying off people for just, just saving their own money. So they have compromised the family value, which will be brand damaging for the long term. 
When it comes to the government, I think government, so in many discussions with owners that I have, so government is often seen as a kind of, oh, this is a kind of bureaucratic burden. So we are lean, we, are, we, we know each other. So we are family, we love each other. So I think government should not be seen as something that you have to have because there is required or state of the art. Government serves a concrete purpose. And the family governance part serves to managing family dynamics and bringing the shareholders behind their codified values and their code of conduct. Whereas the business and the corporate governance allows to keep the business on track. And typically you have the three different governance bodies, which is the shareholders, the family council. They are responsible for the long-term direction of the business. They want to succeed for generation for the long term. They are setting the long term direction. The board, as the supervisory board for managing the business, providing external insight, keeping the business and the strategy on track, and working closely with the management together, also to uh, to make sure that the strategic mid term goals are met and the executive management making sure that everything is properly executed. Every government's role has a certain responsibility, which is clear. The worst thing in family business that can happen, and that I have seen pretty much too often, is that the roles and responsibilities are not respected well. So that shareholders try to interfere with the executive management, not consulting as they should with the board, or the board overstepping their responsibility, or one family member try to play a role in all the three elements, as a shareholder in the board and leading the company. This is not going to work. You need clear roles. You need to know who is doing what and is responsible for. And we have seen great example in Finland, for example, with the Aminov family who has uh, uh, taken uh, a very sophisticated approach to make this happen with very clear responsibilities. They have benefited from this structure in the current crisis because they have all the three dimensions. What's good for the long term? What is what we need to do now? And how can we execute it in a way which is consistent with our core values? And when all the three working closely and good together, then you get stronger out of the crisis as you went in. So just to add to what Elikim uh, just said, I think it's so important and it's part of resilience and one of the topics that we're talking here about uh, agility and resilience. Wonderful. Uh, Elikim, you wanted to share, you wanted to add. Yeah, no, I think Peter just really summed it up really nicely. And I had, um, I wanted to just give um, a, a story which um, illustrates all these three different people working together. Um, you know, when I had, when I found out I had um, COVID-19 and my family was affected, um, as the CEO, um, you know, I found it um, extremely, there were so many different things that we needed to do. Um, and Ghana, people were not disclosing yet. There was a, um, a very, there was a lot of challenge, a lot of challenge with stigma. And so, you know, I had, I informed the board um, in the morning uh, around, you know, I informed the board chairman, um, I'd informed the family members and the family members had actually um, about a few weeks before had been very clear about the core values of the um, founder and of the business, um, which was really around the community, around building trust. Um, trust was really important. And so they were very clear and that was actually captured. So when I brought it up to the board chairman, we had um, a board meeting that morning uh, at 8, 8 a.m. Everyone jumped on the call. Now the board, and this is whereby they had the requisite skills for the company. Um, I was clear for myself personally, I wanted to disclose my status. That was about my personal values. What the board, because they had clarity about the organization, they were also very supportive, but they looked at the political risk because we were currently going through the um, public private conversation, looked at reputational. I mean, and we, they gave us the parameters to um, come up with our PR and comms plan. But then I then went to my exec team, which was the employees, the non-family members, and they have this goes, they put it together, they did the wording, um, and then they came back and I shared it back to the board. We shared to the shareholders. And then by the afternoon, um, I'd done a video and it went out on LinkedIn and went out across. And it was picked up by national media as well as um, WhatsApp, everyone was sharing. 
and it was about the first person to break their status. Now, I can say that I, in that emotional mindset, my emotional state was, I was very much in shock. I was able to make decisions, but if it hadn't been for all these three parties with different skills, I might have made a decision which would have been the same, but I might have been so emotional that the execution would have been affected and it would not maybe have had as good an impact as it did. So it's just to illustrate that point that Peter was making. Definitely. Very important. Um, Skulk, you want to ask a question? Peter, I like the way that you articulate um, you know, license to, to operate because it plays so much into defining your purpose, you know, at, at, similar to what Elikim has just referred to. So question for you, Peter, um, you know, throughout your interactions with businesses, your family businesses, you know, over the last six months or even prior to that, um, how, how good are family businesses to articulate their purpose clearly? And have you seen businesses actually now through this crisis sit down and articulate their purpose or maybe not articulate it, but actually it being revealed to them just by virtue of, um, you know, the crisis that they, 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 they had to endure? Uh, it's a very good question, Skalk. Uh, so, and um, uh, yes, of course, we have this discussion and we started the discussion with business owners uh, before that because all the concepts of sustainability, climate change becomes more relevant and this is undeniable and irreversible that this will become more business relevant for smaller and larger businesses in the future. Um, it has multiple um, consequences. Uh, we see that with our bigger clients, but also it moves down the ladder also to smaller and medium-sized companies. Uh, if you don't have a clearly articulated good course and purpose and a good focus, what you want to contribute to, it's getting harder to get sufficient finding access to capital. So it's obvious in the shipping industry, for example, yeah, if you build the ship with heavy oil, yeah, so that uh, pollutes the air a lot, you don't get proper financing anymore. It's coal and mining industry, yeah, so the big venture funds, private equities, institutional investors, they get out of that industry entirely. You are blacklisted if you are an oil and gas mining and so on, you're totally blacklisted. Yeah, so uh, you want to have a separate department with renewables, uh, with renewable energy, with smart solutions, electromobility and so on in order to survive. This has an impact. But also beyond the business, a purely business impact, and I think this is part of your question, Skalk, is um, many families doing great and giving back to society. In the past, it was their an element of their philanthropic uh, ventures, giving back, doing good, but do not talk about it. Yeah, so the, the humble, we want to go low profile, humble, doing good and do not talk about it. Uh, this is slowly but truly now changing because it's part of the overall license to operate. And they see that hidden and stay in the shadow was yesterday. You have to step out of the shadow and show it to the public what you do what total impact you make on the way how you treat your workforce, how many families you will have an impact on by creating jobs, what the kind of product and services that you uh, that you render to your end customer, the tax you are paying without avoiding taxes by complicated and not ethical tax schemes that you're falling into and what you give back to communities and et cetera. This gives one picture and I think this is today even more important than it's ever been, because at the same time where we're talking about the family business and private businesses as backbone of economies, GDP growth and and um, and also job creator number one, at the same time, politicians talking about taxation, wealth tax, inheritance tax, because somebody has to pay for the crisis. Yeah, and this is what we also see. There is uh, in the uh, wealth asymmetry that fewer people getting richer and richer and majority of average people getting poorer and poorer. This also fosters a political discussion that what the easy answer would be, tax the rich people higher. And every entrepreneur is, uh, is expected to be a rich person that should be taxed higher totally ignoring that especially family business 
don't have their money in cash at the private pocket. It's all invested to make a total contribution through their business. And if private businesses fail and not manage to tell the entire story, not just part of their story, uh, then they get in a, in a very difficult position. And this is what we see in the discussion that we have with our clients. Yes, they see, of course, here we do more than we have communicated in the past. It might be better to, to tell the entire story and be, be consistent in your total behavior, what you do. Because there are also, let's be honest, there are also bad examples. Yeah, there are also bad examples for people not paying taxes in their country, leaving their countries, uh, lay off people. Not every family business adhere to strong values, but those who do, they want to talk more about that for the future of their own family, for the future of the legacy and the business and the people they are looking after and are responsible for. Yeah, long answer to a short question, Charles. Yeah, but communication is key and family business make a huge total contribution and this story needs to be told. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, I'm just gonna give some feedback on our poll and then open our next poll um, and then come back to the questions of, from the audience. Uh, so the one question was, did you have to make any adjustment to your business model? Um, and the audience said, majority said partly. So I think everyone, been um like we know been affected and then has your business culture been influenced uh due to COVID-19 and again majority said yes um Elika, from if we stand still on on company culture uh what would you see see and say has been the, the greatest change what have you seen um so I was you know I was actually um going to I'll, I'll Ty, I saw a message in the um, chat, a question about my, my mother's role. And I think that the culture was, um, you know, the mission, vision, values was um, a clear focus for the family um, to ensure that the culture was consistent. And so I think that, you know, with last, I mean, she, when she stepped down from being the chairman, she became the emeritus chairman. Um, and in that role is an honorary role to be the kind of curator of cult culture. Um, to be the reminder of what we stood for. So she attends the board meetings. It's just, she's just not, not a, she's not a voting member. But what I found is that for the board, she was able to keep reminding them about the, that family values that um, Peter just mentioned about, um, you know, why we're doing what we're doing. That it's not just about profit. Profit is definitely a marker of a good business, but it's really what's more important is actually delivering on the vision to give care to patients and to impact the community. And so that's helped the board to get, you know, because the board would, um, it gives the board that ability to get a, a, a true north, but then also for the entire company last year, she did mission, vision, values, curating those stories. We only started it towards the end of the year and then COVID came. Um, which meant that, you know, one of the things that we've started to think about is how do we really embed our culture um, through capturing these stories, maybe through videos, storytelling, et cetera, um, and using the crisis to illustrate when these values are actually being demonstrated. So, I mean, definitely, for example, with trust and authenticity, sharing and creating that culture of trust is about being open and so part of me disclosing my status was part of living out the culture that this is as a healthcare facility to build trust. People need to know that we can say that we are sick, <laughs> we are human beings. Um, so I think that was, um, you know, we just need to rethink, we need to do that more. I'd say that um, we look at other family businesses around the world. And um, I think that you see that those companies that have done really well um, have been able to curate those stories that bring their values to life. Absolutely. And the, so when you said, so the main purpose uh, is uh, uh, treating patients so uh, not making profit, this uh, really reminds me on the interview that I did with Andre Hoffman, so uh, chairman of, of Roche and one of the uh, Roche owners family. He, he said exactly the same in our last family business survey. So the purpose of Roche is not making profit, but, but treating patients. The profit is what you need to continue, yeah, and uh, that allows you to continue to stay in business. But it's not, 
uh, the number one goal per se. It's nicely said, absolutely. Andrea, if I may, I find it quite I find it quite interesting from the polling question that our participants say that you know the crisis has impacted or, or, or necessitated a change to their culture because you know, one would expect that the culture already exists in an organization and that perhaps the crisis has maybe just challenged the culture of the organization um, um, as opposed to changing it. I wonder if the panelist Elakim or Peter, whether you have an observation um, on that. Oh, absolutely. Maybe I start uh, with with my observation here. So, you know, um, the crisis has uh, put all people in a very new uh, new situation. People who were used to fly around the globe and visiting clients like myself has been grounded and has to work from home. Board meetings happening through uh, through virtual uh, uh, video conference and uh, conference and uh, uh, and so on. So there was a necessity to find new ways of making things happen in business, in communication, in personal interaction, including client workshops and so on. And this was true for us, PwC as an organization, but also for our clients. This is, of course, also having an impact on the on the on, on the culture and based on recent evidence from service that we did and and conversation that we have with executives is that there is a new culture of trial and error yeah so six months prior to the crisis everybody was expecting that um, that everything has to be perfect yeah adhere to very high standards today it's okay to try and error even if it's just 80 percent good enough yeah so it don't has to be 100 percent. it it has freed to a certain extent a new kind of entrepreneurial spirit but on the other hand side so this is what i've experienced with many of my clients is so homework working remotely from home creates a different challenge that elikim referred to at the beginning taking care of yourself, mental issues, yeah? So in the first week of shutdown, it was just empty. You don't have too much to do. In the second week, you started to use a computer and so on. And today, you feel a lot of pressure because you, uh, you, you think you have to be online in front of your computer from 8 to 8 o'clock, 8 in the morning to 8 o'clock in the evening. You don't have a, have a rest anymore. You don't have social interaction anymore. And this has a big impact on the culture and uh, taking care more care of yourself um, your mental health and these aspects uh, were not really addressed in the past this is new coming through the crisis elike maybe you have your own view on that but i think yes so and in this regard Schalk, Schalk, it's not necessarily bad that the culture is changing because there was a new new challenge working through, through a challenge and that the culture of failing is okay, failing is allowed. I think it's not, it's not necessarily bad and it will create a lot of new business models and will free up a lot of innovation. I'm pretty confident. Yeah, I think um, thanks a lot for sharing, Peter, because I, I, I definitely um, think that the impact, I, I reckon I, I can identify some of our experiences and what Peter mentioned. And it's amazing when you speak to people around the world that there are shared experiences of this. Um, I would say that um, the crisis is um, a pressure cooker or it's um, a stress test of the culture as well um, in that um, it brings out the reality, it brings it out. Um, so it's very messy um, and I think that you know you see all the negative sides, all the, all the sides of your culture that are not working start to come out. Um, and so then the question is, what do you do? Do you just accept it or do you leave it or do you adapt and change? So, I mean, I definitely say that we have, um, it's a culture that is revealing itself, it's changing. And then also it's about our ability to say, where do we want that culture to be and what do we need to do? So that focus on mental health, um, you know, I can say that personally, I've benefited a lot from focusing on that, but, you know, in the organization, um, a lot of people are really stressed um, and are not having good boundaries. 
Um, and so the question is that, do we wait for that to happen, for burnout to, to occur? Because then decision-making is poor. Um, people being able to contribute and being productive is affected. Um, so we definitely had to you know, say, okay, this is not acceptable. We need to do something about it. And so we've changed and we're talking that it's fine to be, it's fine to fail in our culture in Ghana. Everyone has to wear the, everyone has to be the best. Um, that there's a certain perception about what you uh, present of yourself. Um, and people don't like to present an image of themselves that is less than. So it's something that is changing our culture as well as a, as a Ghanaian society, because yeah, people are, you can't be perfect in this time. But it's actually so amazing because vulnerability and being open and transparent, um, that's actually the breeding ground for innovation and starting something new and being agile. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. Uh, so just on, on the topic of succession as well, because we know that's critical for the success and continuity of any, any family business. Um, so you've alluded to that you, and we know that you have, um, your family has a family constitution and a succession plan in place. But did you have to adjust any of the plans during this time? Yes, um, we had to revisit. I mean, there's a lot more work that we have to do as well. We had to revisit the family constitution um, during this period. Um, I think that succession planning was very much an intent um, in, but at, as compared to other areas that we had been able to execute, it was one area that you know we are still working on, because I think whereby the sibling, you know, the fact that you know we had a number of interventions, it came, really came out that I was leading a lot of these, and the impact of that on my other family members brought about conflict situations as to hey, who said you should be the one to lead that? Um, it's kind of evolved to that because of where you're sitting, but. I want to have a contribution too, and and we realized that probably um, the intent had been articulated, but the how had not. This is really for the family. Um, the business side, I think succession planning. We have an HR director. I mean, we have all the roles. Who's ready for what role? But I think around the family, and um, that's definitely one area that we are focusing on now. And we have a few more conversations as to how do we make decisions for the family. The next generation being, so this current generation has my sister and my older sister. So um, this is really the generation that we're referring to. My children are four and one. So what we are clear on is that we need to resolve our issues first so we don't leave a legacy issue um, for them. Please, that's great that you're learning and taking these uh, challenges and actually like we said, making it opportunities and um, you know, learning from it. So, Peter, what have you seen from the other family business globally um, from a succession point of view? Yeah, we have seen two trends. Uh, number one is that due to the fact that COVID has uh, had a very high risk, especially for the elder generation. So, we saw that more of the typical elder family business leader, some patriarch or matriarchal person were thinking more about that they are become vulnerable so that uh, they have to settle their affair, that they have to put a testament in place, what they try to avoid or try to ignore in the past. So the crisis forced them to think about what happened to me, to the family, uh, 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 to my family, to my business, if something happened to me. So um, I think this was good so that people became more conscious about the need for uh, getting your affairs in order. And the second element that we saw is that uh, families realize the potential of the next generation um, to contribute. And uh, since technology became so, so fundamental, important, for communication, for uh, keeping the business running, uh, homework, uh, uh, remote homework, and so on. Uh, there were more and more, even very young, in the teenage or in the early 20s next gen, who were able to help out in the business, to manage technology, to, uh, to contribute with their ideas, what's important, what the view of the younger generation really is. 
And I think this is great that has um, fostered the discussion between the generation and this uh, creating a positive uh, impact on on a good discussion in in the family where the family wants to be, in which direction they want to organize for succession. To add to Elikim's point, I think it's always important um, if you agree that you need to agree that you have an external facilitator of the discussion. Yeah, whatever you decide finally, but having an external moderator, a facilitator is always good because uh, if you try to take a lead as a family member, so you cannot avoid that some other members may think that you have your own hidden agenda. So, and you can always blame and fire an external moderator without compromising the family <laughs> dynamic and uh, family cohesion. I think this is the important part. Uh, and the other is um, the succession means for many business owners, who is the next leader of the business? And I think this is not uh, enough going forward. Uh, next generation of family members can have, in my point of view, three different roles. And there's a choice to make. You can be a responsible shareholder and shareholder and responsible shareholder is a person who adhere and believes in the core values of the family and make sure that he or she lives up to the value and also is humble with dividend expectation and so on so that they do not compromise the future of the business. The second choice might be become a board member. But a board member is something that you need to qualify for and their competence matters. So competent board member is another role that you may want to play in your family business and that needs proper preparation and also some experience that you want to bring to the table. And last but not least, the typical case, the next visionary leader who is really leading the business in the new normal into the futures. But I think taking all the three aspects into consideration when it comes to the succession planning, who is continuing as a responsible shareholder, competent board member or visionary leader, this is setting the direction for the future. And I think the time is now, and this is what we see that more families start to have the conversation within the families acknowledging that there is a lot of potential of family members playing in one of these three different roles. So if we um, continue on the trend of the next gen, um, so they can be engaged to develop their agile and resilient leadership through experience, um, experiential learning and through shadowing the senior members in this critical time. This can help to transform the family from one reliant on personal resilience to one where the system resilience across the generations. Uh, so, Peter, have you seen a lot of shadowing and mentoring uh, with other families? Yes, we see that. But uh, the, the interesting fact is that we start to see a reverse trend now that the senior generation start to shadowing the younger ones. Yeah, so because uh, the way that we have done business in the past and the conventional way of thinking, this is how we are running our business for the last 10, 20 years. This will not be the future. And, uh, and this became very clear. So new recipes, how to manage going forward, how to respond to new trends, how to upskill people, uh, what is a new business model going forward and so on. There are so many challenges. You need to have the view of the next generation, the younger generation to, re to reinvent yourself in a way. Yeah, so it's not enough to copy paste what father and grandfather has done. So this will be a recipe for failure. So, but everybody is now looking for no, new recipes for success. And this means, so next gens who has a certain level of experience and the proper education are now seen much more as a great source to reinvent the formula for future success and help to build a solid, resilient business for the future. And I think this is a positive trend yeah? because we found in our last next gen survey, which we published by by chance uh, end uh, of uh, last year in November, that the next gens feel ready to take over and to have a role in the family business, but they haven't granted the license to operate yet. And the crisis now uh, in many cases gives them a mandate to operate. And I think this is good. And we will see 
a lot of positive impact coming out of that. But I'm also convinced that we will see many family business failing to reinvent themselves. Mm, no, strongly agree. Um, Ilikam, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think it's been well. I mean, I think um, the only, I mean, probably the the thing that drives us is that we want to be existing um, for the next 50 years. Um, and I definitely think that listening to Peter, and I mean, we very much learned that you can learn from many best practices. Um, the hard uh, the hard task is actually to have the conversations um, that and have the humility actually to have the conversations. And so, um, you know, I think we are also on that journey. And um, yeah, we found partnerships with PwC and you know also other pe other other people who've been through this um, always helpful. Let's make an example here. So maybe to illustrate that a little bit, we are currently in discussion also with the big groups in the Middle East, which are in retail, consumer and so on. And and um, and by looking at new business models and how the future of retail mall operators and so on will look like. And what we're introducing right now is the concept of using uh, virtual reality and augmented reality yeah, to create customer experience before you you are you are building it right and you can make a nice analogy in the 60s a test pilot was driving a jet and putting his life at risk today you go to a simulator yeah so without any physical risk to them and we can do exactly the same we can create new worlds uh, and new customer experience before the building before the mall is even built yeah, so we see that in maintenance uh, uh, for elevator, ThyssenKrupp elevator is doing that using augmented reality to support the maintenance staff to repair and to fix issues. And I'm wondering where these technologies, for example, can be transferred to the medical space, uh, Elikim, right? So let's assume you have in a remote place in Ghana, a person so that you cannot see physically who is not able to come to your place. Yeah, maybe to what extent it's possible to use technology yeah, the, to uh, to identify uh, that the change of the eyes has the change so, uh, to, to do whatever you need to do to make a proper diagnosis and then use also drones to bring the right technology or even medicine to the places needed. So, and I think this kind of technology uh, uh, it will be of critical importance for the future and the younger generation better understand the potential of these technologies. Maybe if you um, I don't know your mom, but maybe maybe your mom is less experienced with virtual and augmented reality than than uh, than the eldest son of your uh, uh, of your uh, sister or something like that, right? So this is what I'm trying to say. And this kind of of new input, uh, new ideas, disruptive thinking out of the box of your industry kind of thinking will be of critical importance for the long term success. Definitely. So um, thank you for that, Peter. So as our last question, I see um, so gone so quickly that our, our hour is almost all done. Um, what will be some advice that you give to family businesses on the call? Question goes to Elikim, myself, or to both? Or I saw what's Elikim. I think that, I mean, Peter's, I mean, I think what Peter's mentioned, I mean, um, family businesses are SMEs and medium sized. I mean, if you think about it, there's a rich resource of knowledge and you really want to tap it. You want to tap every, every possible um, aspect to leverage it for the, for the sake of the business. Um, and so that's where, you know, I completely agree that, you know, next gen, um, you know, I'm, I'm a millennial, so virtual reality, augmented reality, all those things are very much on my, my radar. And, but at the same time, my mom has experience, which, you know, has to be leveraged and I've used it, especially when it comes to relationships, whereby she's built relationships over time where I am not, I, I, I will not translate well <laughs> in those circumstances. Um, and so, I mean, even with the non-family members of the organization, um, I think what um, my advice would be to, yeah, leverage that. Come, come up with the structures um, to be able to leverage it, um, because I think that when you're able to harness it, that's when the business become resilient. 
definitely. And uh, yes, yeah, so for that, um, Skulk, over to you to, to close. And thank you so much for sharing your stories. It's been invaluable and really interesting. Thank you, um, Andrea. And as I said at the beginning, um, I, I, I didn't think an hour is going to be enough time, and I'm sure we can carry on for the rest of the afternoon. But um, unfortunately, there are other things that has to be done. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Again, Alakim, thank you for taking time out of your very busy diary. Peter, taking some time out of your well-deserved um, holiday. You know, the key thing that I uh, will take away from today's discussion um, is what we discussed in, in a bit of length was around purpose and understanding the purpose of um, the business, aligning the values between you know, the family and, and the business. And to answer this question, you know, what is your license to operate? So I'm gonna leave with that. And uh, thank you for all the participants that have joined today. And we're looking forward to having you all again in two weeks time at our next PwC Family Business Lunch Hour, where we will be talking about strategy and repurposing. So thanks again to, for everyone's participation today. Thank you, Elikim. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Andrea. And uh, we wish you all an uh, enjoyable rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.